Order. It's time for questions to the Office of the First Minister and Deputy First Minister, and we will start with listed questions. And I have to tell you that question 1 and question 14 have been withdrawn. I therefore call on Mr Mickey Brady. Chair Silver, no question to uh, we, we met with the First Minister of Scotland on the 20th of October in Belfast and the First Minister of Wales on the 22nd of October in Cardiff uh, to discuss opportunities for seeking additional devolved powers. Discussions were wide-ranging, constructive and had a major focus on the devolution of fiscal powers including corporation tax, air passenger duty, landfill tax, aggregates levy and bonds and borrowing. We also touched on the benefits around devolving welfare policy and administration and the continuing use of the Barnett formula. During these initial discussions, it was apparent that each administration has different devolved arrangements and powers, so the focus for each will clearly be different in regard to adopting further fiscal powers. However, there was a will to use our collective strength to work together where we have common aims and support each other when we have different areas of interest and focus. Since the Scottish referendum last month, we have made, our clear, made clear our expectations regarding further fiscal devolution for our administration. Securing the powers to lower corporation tax is a key priority for the executive. As part of our economic pact, which we signed last year, the UK government indicated the intention to make a decision on the devolution of corporation tax powers no later than the coming autumn statement on 3rd of October, December. This has involved discussions with the uh, Secretary of State and we have also written to the Prime Minister to press him to come to a decision quickly and ensure the swift devolution of corporation tax powers. Well, Mr Brady for a supplementary. I thank the Minister for his answer and can I ask the Minister what economic benefits can be expected from the transfer of corporation tax? Well, a previous work back in 2011 estimated that 58,000 uh, jobs could be created, uh, but since then we have seen the British rate fall from 28% to 20%, and so a large reduction has therefore already been achieved. But uh, we do not believe that this reduction to 20% goes far enough, and there are still significant improvements to our competitiveness to be achieved from reducing corporation tax further. This could give us uh, an all-Ireland rate of 12.5%. The uh, NI Centre for Economic Policy at the University of Ulster has been commissioned to provide an up-to-date assessment of the economic impact of cutting corporation tax to 12.5%, and this work is expected to be completed in November. Call Mr John McAllister. Uh, thank you, uh, Deputy Speaker. Grateful to the Deputy First Minister for his reply. The research that was done and, and the new, uh, the fresh look that you're having at it, could the Deputy First Minister tell him, is he going to build into that the possibility that Scotland would be receiving the part of very corporation tax? Because that could have a fundamental impact on, on the projection of 58,000 jobs and indeed what rate we might set at. Well, I, I think the member raises a, an important issue. Uh, you know, we're all very conscious that over the course of the next uh, while, there are going to be very serious discussions taking place between the uh, Scottish Government and Westminster in relation to uh, increased powers as a result of the uh, referendum debate. And uh, obviously, in the previous engagements that both the First Minister and I have had with uh, David Cameron, uh, he has at all stages emphasised the uniqueness of our situation here in regard to uh, the land frontier with the South, which has a 12.5% rate of corporation tax. So uh, that's an unknown at the moment. It is a valid point which we will have to take into consideration as we uh, further uh, develop this, uh, this process. But I think it's important to point out that in the course of the engagements with Downing Street and with David Cameron, he made it clear that uh, his decision would come prior to Christmas. 
and I doubt if there's going to be a decision in relation to Scotland's situation prior to Christmas. So we will have to deal with that situation as it, uh, as it develops. Uh, but we are working on the basis that, uh, as D David Cameron has said, our situation is uh, much more uh, unique than the situation which presently uh, confronts Westminster in relation to uh, the Scotland issue. Call Mr. Danny Kinahan. Mr. Deputy Speaker, may I thank the Deputy First Minister for his answer so far. In your answer, he mentioned corporation tax, but it, many feel it's not just the silver, silver bullet by itself. There's a mass of other things that have to happen. Does he have a hit list of all the other things that should be happening, not just in each of our departments, but in relation to Wales, England, Scotland, and indeed in Ireland? We need to place ourselves in the best position so that we can really thrive on it in the future. Thank you. Well, you know, I think the member will, will, be remember, that in, will remember that in June uh, 2013, whenever we published our Building a Prosperous and uh, United Community, uh, it, it included a commitment by the government and the executive to examine the potential for devolving uh, specific additional fiscal powers. So our officials are currently uh, examining a range of, of issues to consider uh, in relation to what can be devolved, and, and that in the context of ensuring that there's a, a clear economic benefit uh, for us in, in terms of uh, increased powers. So, you know, the, the different issues that are being considered are, are things like VAT, income tax, national insurance contributions, landfill tax, stamp duty, land tax, tobacco and alcohol duties, fuel duties, aggregates levy, and short haul air passenger duty. So I suppose, you know, from our perspective, the, the, the key test will be uh, whether or not there's an economic benefit for us. But I think there is a, a considerable uh, amount of agreement among parties presently involved in discussions that uh, very serious exploration needs to take place as to whether or not we can enhance our fiscal capability against the backdrop of the swinging cuts, particularly to our block grant uh, that this British government have been engaged in over the course of the last four years. Well, Mr. Phil Flanagan for question. the last question, Corley Cash, number three. Question number three. Uh, last question, Corley, with your permission, I will ask Junior Minister McKeon to answer this question. We welcome the appointment of a new European Commission. The First Minister and the Deputy First Minister have written to the new Commission President Juncker and the new Commissioners congratulating them on their new appointments to Agriculture, Financial Stability and Regional Policy respectively. They have invited them to visit when we can show them what has been achieved with the EU help and what we can offer to others by way of our experience. We will engage fully with other Commissioners in due course. We had a productive relationship with the last Commission, facilitated greatly by the Barossa Task Force Working Group. Commissioner Mara Gogan Quinn, in particular with the Research, Innovation and Science portfolio. Our relationship with Phil Hogan as Agricultural Minister Commissioner will be equally important. After last week's publication of the report of the European Commission's uh, Task Force in relation to the North, we welcome the comments of outgoing President Barroso on the positive impact of this initiative. He stated that the task force had helped the region to participate more fully in the network economy, which is so essential to, be, to building regional prosperity in the 21st century. Given the significant importance of the task force, the First Minister and the Deputy First Minister have pressed for the continuation of our structured relationship with the Commission. We very much welcome the recent comments of Commissioner Kretschu when she commi committed to maintaining the work of the task force. Well, Mr. Flanagan, for supplement. Given the, the continuing constraints on the, the budgets here, um, can I ask the uh, junior minister um, for an update on how we are progressing in relation to our drawdown of EU funds and the, the effort to increase them by 20 per cent? Well, obviously, um, uh, we want to, to um, you know, have the maximum benefit of any um, drawdown of funds, and that is obviously what we are always looking at. Departments do continue to make good progress towards meeting the 20% target. In 2011-12, year one, departments drew down £23 million, £23 million um, pounds, and in 2012-13, year two, they drew down £18.3 million. 
At the halfway point in the budget period, 41.3 million has been drawn down, which represents 64 per cent of the target. Departments are well on track to exceed the total drawdown of 64.4 million by the end of March 2015. Figures for 2013 and 14 will be published as soon as they have been completed. And there has been some difficulties at the European level with confirming drawdowns sometimes in some, in some programmes, which have led to a delay in um, the validation of sorry, year three figures. But certainly we're always about trying to maximise and use the, the best benefit, the monies that can be um, secured and accessed at EU level. Well, Mr. Alban McGuinness. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for her answer. Uh, just in relation to Horizon 2020, which is very, very important in terms of research and development here in Northern Ireland, uh, would the Minister agree with me that uh, a, a less modest, a more ambitious target uh, could be achieved by us? And has the Minister and her department any plans in order to revise the target figure? Well, as I said to uh, the member in the previous question, that we ha are looking at how we can maximise to, to the best of our advantage um, the drawdown of funding. And indeed, the Borussia Task Force Working Group has been working on the production of a set of European priorities for 2014-15. And I think that, that we are going to um, you know, look at those priorities and, and when they're published to see what we can do. There's also a lot of work getting done in terms of committing to the performance um, in terms of benchmarking and again we will be looking to maximise whatever benefits and if that means uh, actually raising the targets then, then we will look to do that also. Well, Mr Tom Elliott. Thank you very much Deputy Speaker and uh, thank the Junior Minister for the detailed answers to the particularly the first set of, of questions uh, and responses but I'm wondering if the Junior Minister can tell me in detail what financial income has come from the Barrasso Task Force so far to Northern Ireland? Well, I think in terms of the Barrasso Task Force that what we have to look at is not just about the financial benefits from it, but the networking and all that that has been done also in terms of that. I think that, that really when we, when we um, look at, at how we actually look at the report in detail, we can see you know that, that they actually said that there's been a lot of networking done in terms particularly around health, agriculture, in terms of, of education and other issues. And I think that really that, that type of you know, integrating policy and looking at policy and how best models of practice can be actually applied here is beneficial as well, um, as well as uh, the financial drawdown that we do as well. Mr Stephen Mutry for a question. Question number four, Deputy Speaker. Uh, with your permission, Ms. Kenneth Collier, I will ask Junior Minister McCann to answer this question. We feel that it is incredibly important that we have the trust and confidence of victims and survivors of abuse. We listen very carefully to victims and survivors' wishes when we set up the inquiry into historical institutional abuse, ensuring that these were accurately reflected in its terms of reference. The well-being, both emotionally and physically, of victims and survivors has been at the heart of all decision-making. Since January 2012, arrangements have been in place with Lifeline to provide ongoing face-to-face -face and telephone crisis counselling. From August 2013, Contact NI have also been contracted to provide a bespoke support service for victims and survivors with a wide range of provision. A coordinator oversees the delivery of the service. In addition, OFMDFM funds a drop-in counselling facility in both Derry and Belfast. Support is also provided by the inquiry's dedicated witness support officers. They provide support for victims and survivors, attending the acknowledgement forum and the oral hearings in Banbridge. Call Mr. Mutri for supplement. Good Speaker. The focus of my question is the importance of maintaining trust and confidence of the victims. Given the role that you have played over the past number of weeks in relation to sexual abuse and the comments of the Deputy First Minister in the debate last week, how can victims have any confidence in you to deliver? Well, Mr Deputy Speaker, I wish I could say I'm surprised that the member has sought to use the historical uh, institutional abuse inquiry for party political reasons again. I, I, I order, expected please. it. Order, please. And order, please. The Minister, I have repeatedly said I will not accept 
any shouting from a sedentary position. And I must also point out to members that you do not use the term you. All remarks through the chair. Continue. Okay, well, through the chair, uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Last Tuesday, the DUP, the UUP, and the SDLP lined up to attack me because, in offering help and support to Maria Cahill, I respected her confidentiality of my conversations with her and her decision at that time not to report her abuse to the police. The leader of the UUP, who I see isn't in his seat, Mike Nesbitt, was more than vocal in his contrived outrage directed at me. And the hypocrisy of his comments was underlined on Thursday when he admitted that he did not inform police when Maria Cahill told him about the abuse in 2008. The difference is I was a work colleague and had no authority at that time when I was told. Mr Nesbitt, in contrast, was a victim's commissioner at the time that he became aware. And can I just end by victims and survivors of abuse deserve our support and help, not the petty political and personalised point scoring that marked the debate in this assembly last week and continues today to mark it in question time. Uh, before moving on, if I get any more remarks from a Saturday position, I will move on to the next question. I call Mr Alex Maskey. Can I ask the, the Minister, has there been any action to address tracing or assessing uh, victims' records? Yes, can I just say to the member, there has been, and what we're doing at the moment is we're working very closely um, with the Historical Institutional Abuse Inquiry in terms of the page in the NI Direct website, for instance, contains a series of helpful, helpful links to guidance on searching for those records, and this includes a link to the website for the Public Records Office, um, PRONI, which is the main avenue for record searches. There, and I myself have met with PRONI and actually went down and, and they have offered to actually put aside a room where victims can, because victims uh, of the historical institutional inquiry had actually asked me to um, make representations on some of their behalf. And they have actually said they would set a, a room aside for them if they wanted to, to go down to look at that. The HIA inqui inquiry can only provide records to a relevant party when it consider considers it necessary to do so in furtherance of the inquiry's purposes. However, there is a document which is used and in which an applicant was unaware they will be told the source from which it was obtained and the individual can then pursue the matter fully with the relevant body. Well, Mr Chris Little. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Given the increasing scale and seriousness of allegations of conflict-related sexual violence, what progress has OFM-DFM made with its consideration of constituting a public inquiry into non-institutional child abuse? Well, the member um, will, be, will be aware that we have been looking at looking at the scope of the inquiry in terms of even people who were over 18 um, and were in institutions at the time of their abuse. Um, and also um, people in the mother and baby homes also. And I will say that, that last week, uh, one of the, the, the better contributions to the debate was made by the Deputy First Minister when he put forward proposing the establishment of an all-island initiative resourced by and under the remit of both the Irish government and the executive through the North-South Ministerial Council, which will ensure that victims and survivors have access to the professional support services they need, and crucially, a channel through which those complaints can be made to the appropriate statutory agency or police service. I call Mr Sean Lynch for a question. Yes, I have a question five. Uh, last year, I'll call you with your junior Minister McKenna to answer this question. <clears throat> A research study entitled An Investigation of Gender Equality Issues at the Executive Level in the Public Sector Organisations was published by our office on the 22nd of October. The published report presents the stages one and two of the findings. Stage one was a literature review and an analysis of publicly available data. Stage two comprised of a survey delivered to current and aspiring executives within 143 organisations. Stage three is a series of interviews with male and female executives and a final research re report, including the findings from stage three is ongoing. It will be published in February and March 2015. The findings from these reports will help to inform the new gender equality strategy that is currently being developed. Mr Lynch for supplementary. 
Go on, Gwek, the Slicing Arras and Fagrushin. Can the Minister outline how the findings of this report will influence the development of a new gender equality strategy? The Gender Equality Strategy 2006 to 16 sets out an overarching framework for departments, their agencies, and other relevant statutory authorities to promote gender equality. One of the strategic objectives of the Gender Equality Strategy is to achieve a gender balance on all government-appointed committees, boards and other relevant official bodies. Within our new Gender Equality Strategy, we aim to adopt a positive approach to identifying, understanding and responding to the and different needs of men and women, develop the actions to address underrepresentation, including reconsidering policies that act as barriers and ensure that gender stereotypes do not influence policy development and decision-making processes. Call Mr. Michael McJimsey. Thank you, uh, Deputy Speaker. Uh, and could I ask, bearing in mind that we have 11 departments and we have uh, 11 permanent secretaries heading up those departments, 100% male, that we have grade three, 77% male, that we have grade five, 58% male. The Deputy First Minister has in the past agreed with me that this situation is totally unacceptable. When can we expect to see a permanent secretary uh, uh, balance that properly reflects the, the, the gender balance within the, uh, the civil service? Thank you. I, th I think it's well known, um, the, the civil service, the underrepresentation uh, of women, uh, particularly at the higher levels. And I think that, that really looking at the gender equality strategy, um, we're trying to set out an overarching framework for all departments, their agencies and the other relevant uh, statutory authorities to promote gender equality. So we do have a particular focus um, on tackling those inequalities. But we have to see, um, you know, obviously the, the barriers and the inequalities, the structural inequalities that are in wider society is reflected. I mean, we only have to look around this chamber here to see the underrepresentation of women in political life as well. That's also for public life and particularly for the civil service and particularly at the upper echelon. So we are working hard to try to, um, you know, to, to challenge that in, in whatever way we can. Call Mr. Gregory Campbell. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Uh, the junior minister will be aware that up until about four or five years ago, there was a significant imbalance in the civil service, particularly at the AA and AO level, which is by far the most numerous, and that affected both young Protestant males and young Protestant females. Given that the situation has improved somewhat in the past three or four years, will she undertake to keep that under review? I will, I will undertake to uh, challenge inequality no matter where it exists or where it comes from. I think respect, <coughs> tolerance and uh, challenging inequality have to be the ethos of any civilised um, or any, any uh, sort of government or executive. So I do, I do take uh, very seriously that job of work and I will be, um, as I said, looking um, where inequalities exist to uh, challenge them and to try and do something constructive in order to make it um, more, uh, more of an equal workforce. Well, Mr. Colm Eastwood for a question. Uh, question number six, please. Uh, last can I you, with your permission, I will ask Junior Minister McCann to answer this question. The Historical Institutional Abuse Inquiry has now completed the oral hearings in respect of the first two modules, the Sisters of Nazareth Homes in Derry and the Child Migrant Programme. The oral hearings in respect of De La Salle Boys Home, Ruban House, commenced on the 29th of September and are scheduled to finish by the end of November. On the basis of the inquiry panel's experience of the first module, the chairperson, Sir Anthony Hart, has made a very persuasive and compelling case for a one-year extension to the inquiry timeframe, most notably on the basis of the inquiry panel's experience to date of the first module. We agree with Sir Anthony that the inquiry must provide every opportunity for those impacted by the allegations of institutional abuse to be heard in an open forum. A small piece of enabling subordinate legislation is required in order to extend the time frame for the inquiry, and the Executive has agreed to the making of an order subject to the approval of the Assembly. The order will be subject to draft affirmative resolution procedure before the Assembly, um, uh, so it will be coming to, to the Assembly very soon. Mr Eastwood, for supplement. Uh, thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. I'm going to thank the Minister for uh, her answer. Give, given the current f financial uncertainty, can the Minister give us a commitment 
uh, than any future decision around reparations for victims uh, will be unaffected by, by the current financial uh, difficulties. Well, well, the member will be aware that you know, we are looking for all forms of support for the victims and survivors of historical institution abuse. It is an inquiry um, that's an independent inquiry, and the inquiry will, I know, make a number of recommendations. And we would hope that, that some of those recommendations will include those um, you know, uh, reparations for the victims and survivors. So again, we will have to wait to see what the inquiry says and what the inquiry recommends. But um, again, I would certainly like to see some sort of reparations made in terms of those people um, that have, have went through the inquiry. I call Mr. Chris Hazard. I thank the Minister for answer thus far. Can I ask the Minister perhaps to outline if there is scope for improvement in the support that is available for victims and survivors? Well, yes, and I mean, it has been a, an area of discussion that we have discussed um, quite frequent, frequently um, with the victims and survivors. You know, that the, the, the support that they get, you know, sometimes they, they feel isn't, the, the, uh, isn't adequate enough. So I think we are always trying to do things better in, in, that re, in relation to that. Um, as I said, I've consistently met with victims groups and individuals in relation to their experience at, at the inquiry, and I've taken on board issues that they have raised in relation to how things could be improved. And I know Junior Minister Bell and myself um, will be reviewing the services constantly to address those issues, and I will do everything in my power to ensure the support services are, are delivering for victims. And that goes across the board, um, what, whatever type of support services that they need. Call Mr. Jim Allister. Could I ask, um, how far, if at all, does the Minister expect the Historical Abuse Inquiry to report on the important issue of the withholding of information from the police about sex abuse uh, in, within the confines of that report? And if it does, will the Minister be at all embarrassed, given her own willful withholding of information, contrary to her legal obligation in 2005 in respect of Maria Cackle? Please. Well, can I just reiterate again, I mean, uh, and I don't know how many times I have to say this, I did nothing wrong in relation to the Maria Cahill case. She, Maria Lord, Cahill... Please, the Minister will resume her seat. For the third time, I have to ask a member not to make remarks from a sedentary position and to give the Minister the respect she's due in answering the question. And I have, I have said, Mr Deputy Speaker, that I was told in confidence by a work colleague, and that, that confidence um, that I was told in, I respected that confidence. At no time did Maria at that time say that she wanted me to report that, and that's what I, I actually, that's why, I mean, I, I, if, you want to, if you want the answer, read Hansart. I very clearly set out in Hansart last week what I did. I did nothing improper. Uh, Ms. Megan Fearn is not in her place. I call Mr. Jimmy Spratt. Mr. Spratt. Question 8, uh, Deputy Speaker. Uh, it is hoped that through the current inter party talks process, the five executive parties can resolve all outstanding issues, including budgetary and financial matters, in a way that protects the most vulnerable in our society. Mr. Spratt, for supplementary. Given uh, the answer that the Deputy First Minister has just given, would he agree with me that uh, it is imperative that this whole issue of welfare reform is sorted out, given that it will affect the most vulnerable, the very people that he spoke of uh, in the very near future, if it's not sorted out? Well, I think that the responsibility for everybody in this House is to work collectively to do uh, the best that we possibly can to pr protect the most vulnerable, the most disadvantaged, the most disabled, the most marginalised within our society. And that represents a real challenge against the backdrop of uh, the strategy that has been employed by the coalition government at Westminster since it was elected four years ago. And of course, since it was elected four years ago, uh, we have seen uh, effectively uh, our our block grant being critically undermined to the tune of over £1 billion. 
that in itself had a very dramatic impact on the, uh, the departments within this administration. But of course, in the aftermath of the uh, putting together and agreeing uh, amongst the five parties entitled to membership of the executive, a programme for government, we then had the hammer blow of uh, welfare cuts, uh, which have been directed at the most vulnerable and marginalised within our society. So, in the context of the uh, present uh, discussions that we're involved in, I think it's fair to say that a very serious investigation has taken place as to how we can resolve the challenges uh, to this administration as a result of policies that are being directed at us from London. And I think over the course of uh, a number of discussions that the First Minister and I have had, particularly with the First Minister of, of Scotland, uh, I, I think that uh, if there is a route to resolve uh, the issue of the uh, welfare cuts which are impacting on us at this time, then that's one area worthy of exploration, and I think that we oh, are the minister's time is up. We are committed to uh, to do just that. Indeed, that ends the period for listed questions. We will now move on to 15 minutes of topical questions. And uh, none was drawn. I think uh, I call Mr. Cahill Washing. Uh, uh, last concordia, given the disparaging and mocking comments made uh, in terms of the Irish language uh, last Monday, uh, could, would the Minister agree with me that uh, such language has no place either in this House or elsewhere? Well, I have to say I, I find the, the remarks made by the member very uh, disappointing indeed, uh, and I think that they were uh, not befitting of uh, membership of this House. And I think since there's been a considerable public debate around it, with many people making an asserting the allegation that the remarks were racist, uh, they were certainly bordering on the racist, and I think there could be no place for them in this chamber. And I think we're all very conscious of the uh, contributions that have been made by the particular member over the course of the lifetime of this assembly. I come from the same city as the member a city that is very determined to move forward, where all shades of political, religious and community uh, people in the city have worked together to improve the lifestyle of people in the city and to bring important gains for the city, which provide, I think, a solid foundation stone on which we can all move forward. Uh, the one politician in the city uh, that's out of sync with that is the member who made those remarks. And I think that I am very conscious that there are, particularly among the unionist benches, people who have a, a terrible hatred of the Irish language and, and, in fact, have a hatred of all things Irish. And I think that's sad because I do think that there are also in the unionist benches people who are progressive, who recognise that working together represents the best way forward for all of us. And I think therein lies the hope. What we have to do is recognise that we need to be uh, working very, very closely together to build a better future for all the people that we represent. And I think ultimately those who harbour the sort of uh, comments that were made last week are effectively people who will be left behind by that approach. Call Mr. Washington for supplementary. Uh, uh, Alaska and Cordo is going based on last year, as an Afragrishian. I thank the Deputy Minister for his answer. And would the Deputy First Minister uh, agree with me that we should lead by example in terms of culture and uh, linguistic tolerance and diversity? Well, uh, I think nobody has anything whatsoever to fear from either the Irish language or from Ulster Scots. And uh, there have been many an occasion within this chamber when he was a, an MLA, Jim Shannon, spoke uh, Ulster Scots, and not one single person on uh, this side of the, uh, of, of the assembly uh, laughed at that or made fun of it, because we all recognise that uh, we, we really should have respect whenever people are speaking 
in a language of their choice. And I remember uh, a, a number of uh, years ago, whenever uh, Rodney Morgan was the First Minister of Wales, he came to the uh, Assembly and spoke in the uh, Senate chamber and, and spoke in Welsh. And nobody made a laughing stock of that. Uh, nobody was in any way derogatory about that. And I think that's where we need to get to. We need to recognise that uh, we all have a responsibility to give leadership. And uh, I think there are many politicians in this House on both sides of, the, uh, of, of, of this forum who do give leadership. Unfortunately, there are still some who don't believe in giving leadership, and I think that's sad. Call Mr. Pat Sheehan for topical question. Over the last Keon Corla. Uh, could I ask the First Minister uh, if it's his view that the project to construct Desert Creek Community Safety College should go ahead? Well, I think the First Minister is content that I will answer this question. <laughs> but uh, obviously, people will be conscious that uh, uh, the Executive met on Thursday. Uh, we did so on foot of uh, the information that came out from the previous uh, weekend that uh, there was a suggestion that uh, the project be discontinued. Uh, the decision on the future of Desert Creek will have to be made by the executive. It, it won't be made by anybody else. It is a program for government commitment and there is a, a huge responsibility on all of us to deliver on our program for government commitments. Something like 12 million pounds has been invested in the site. And I think there has been, for some considerable time, uh, a very reasonable expectation uh, from the people of the Cookstown area that uh, this community safety college will be delivered in Cookstown, which of course would make an enormous difference to the uh, economy of Cookstown and that part of uh, Mid Ulster. Uh, I think also that, that we're all very conscious that, you know, we have seen uh, quite a lot of the institutions of the state uh, centred in the Belfast area. And, and I think the decision by the DARD minister, for example, to relocate the uh, DARD headquarters to Ballykelly uh, sends an important message to people uh, in west of the Ban that uh, we are recognising the challenges uh, that, that face us in relation to uh, the ability to cite important projects in uh, those areas. As is also the case with Desert Creek, I think the uh, political message that it sends about the acceptance of policing is one that we shouldn't ignore. Call Mr. Sheehan for supplementary. I thank the Deputy First Minister for that answer. And I wonder, could he tell us if the funding for the construction of the college is secured in next year's budget? Well, I mean, next year's budget has uh, catered for 53 million uh, allocated to that particular uh, project. So I think the statement that was issued uh, on, on behalf of the executive. Uh, last Thursday, uh, is a very clear commitment that the construction of the Community Safety College is uh, a, a huge priority for uh, our administration. Uh, and I say that against the backdrop of uh, comments that have been made in relation to the requirements of the uh, vital services, the, uh, the essential services that we depend on, such as policing the prison service and indeed the fire and safety authorities. So I think in terms of the scale of the college, uh, the, the scale uh, in all probability will not be on the same scale as originally envisaged, envisaged given the, uh, now the requirements and needs of the emergency services. So I think that the uh, review that will take place over the course of the next while will obviously have to deal with that. But at, at the end of the day, this money has been allocated in the 15-16 budget. It is 53 million. And I think that uh, the sooner we get on with this project, the better, because as far as I'm concerned, it has taken far, far too long. 
Mrs. Karen McKevitt for a topical question. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. And can I ask the Minister, given the debacle um, around the, the delay in delivering the social investment fund, um, have you ever um, um, considered whether it is still worth uh, protecting, um, uh, protecting the fund when other departments are facing major cuts? Well, I, I'll ask Junior Minister McKeon to answer this question. Well, the social investment fund was a fund that was um, sort of put out in terms of trying to tackle poverty and disadvantage. And there was um, a lot of people who are, in, in terms of, of the, the, group, the group that was set up, um, to actually plan ahead. They were the ones that were choosing the projects um, that were going to be <clears throat> in the particular zones and then the allocation got into the zones. I know I think there's 23 letters of offer out now, but I think that those projects, because the people on the ground and the people who were actually um, part of that board, the social investment um, board, in terms of their, their local zones areas, they actually choose themselves which were the important projects for that money to go into. So I think it is important that they go forward because I think that, that really, you know, in community planning and all that, it, it's the people on the ground who actually deal with it every day that know what is needed in terms of tackling poverty and disadvantage. Kevin, first supplementary. <coughs> Speaker, um, can the junior minister then e explain what independent and robust uh, monitor monitoring and reviews have taken place around SIF? Well, when, when in terms of, of the um, independent monitoring and review of SIF, uh, as I said, the, the people, there, there's a board who actually decided where the, 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 the projects that the money was going to begin into. And can I just say, the, the, the member's own colleague uh, made an outrageous um, statement about the, the SIF funding, um, uh, I think it was last week, um, um, where he said that the, it was uh, pet projects of, of Republicans and Loyalists. I can't say that there's nothing further from the truth that the people who decided were those programmes that where that money was going and the programmes, it's actually insulting to those people because those people have worked for years in the community and they are from the statutory bodies and they're, uh, that are on the board. So um, they were the ones that decided what programmes and what projects would be taken forward. Call Mr Samuel Gardner for a topical question. Th thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Will the Deputy First Minister indicate what options might be available to merge services uh, with the Scottish welfare system under his department's improving public services brief? Well, I, I think earlier in my contribution to questions, we, we dealt with the reality that the First Minister and I, and indeed others within the talks, are exercised about the need to find agreement in this area so that we can move forward. And it was, uh, I suppose, to some people encouraging that we actually had uh, the Secretary of State, Theresa Villiers, over the course of the weekend, clearly indicate that the <coughs> British government uh, have a contribution to make to that also. Uh, I think she actually used the word compromise. So in the conduct of our dealing with the situation, in relation to uh, the whole issue of uh, how we provide for our people through uh, a welfare system that is credible and doesn't increase child poverty, doesn't increase hardship for people with disabilities, uh, which doesn't further marginalise the already marginalised, uh, doesn't further disadvantage the already disadvantaged. There is a huge responsibility on all parties within the ongoing talks which are taking place at the moment to, to focus in on the uh, very real impact that the cuts that are coming from London will have on our administration. And, and I suppose there's a considerable level of frustration also that sometimes when there's a debate on local radio, uh, it almost gives the impression that this executive is the executive that's imposing the cuts. We can only, we can only fund uh, what is within our means to fund. And if we're continually being hampered by the ongoing predictions of more uh, austerity coming down the line. That represents a real challenge that we all have to rise to. Mr Gardner, for a supplement. Thank you again, Mr Deputy Speaker. While the Minister has touched on some of it, I'll, I'll ask the, the rest of it. Will the Deputy First Minister tell us if any savings of scale might be affected by other strategic uh, mergers uh, with UK regions outside Northern Ireland in health? Well, well I, I think that uh, 
you know, that's, I suppose, primarily a, a question for the uh, Minister for Health. But, but certainly from our perspective, our focus at the moment is on what represents the biggest challenge to us, uh, the, whole, the whole issue of uh, how we can resolve the difficulties that exist around uh, welfare. I, I will say, I will add that the member raises the issue of how we can, uh, if you like, in many ways work with people in, in England, Scotland and Wales in relation to the health service. It's quite significant that he admitted to talk about how we can work on the island of Ireland with the, another health service that's much closer to us. And for example, if you look at the fact that uh, there'll be huge benefits for everybody with the construction presently ongoing of the radiotherapy unit at Alton Galvin Hospital, and indeed the new wing at Alton Galvin Hospital, uh, clearly you can see that there is much more to be gained by us working in an all-island uh, agenda as opposed to anywhere else. Uh, and I'm very conscious that prior to Michael McGimsey standing down as the Health Minister for uh, three years ago, that uh, I think the Minister had in his possession what was a very comprehensive report on how savings could be made on an all-island basis. And I'm not sure if that report has ever seen the light of day. Order, time is up.